Okay. This is, this is exactly where I want to, where I want to go in this conversation because uh, an altered gut microbiome is causative in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes like you just explained. It's also implicated in type 1 diabetes as we've talked about previously. So uh, the question for you is could you go into a little bit of detail here about what changes are happening other than just changing the, the population of bacteria inside the microbiome that plays a role in the development of type 2 as well as type 1? Is it increased intestinal permeability, bacterial endotoxins? You're a master of all this stuff, so you go into detail and tell us exactly how the pathogenesis of type 2 versus type 1 differs from a gut perspective. Sure. So first of all, uh, I, I would imagine that most of your listeners already know this, but just in case, type 1 diabetes is um, sometimes called juvenile diabetes, and it's autoimmune. It's autoimmune type diabetes um, in the sense that you basically are destroying the islet cells which produce insulin in the pancreas, as opposed to type 2 diabetes, which is not the destruction of the cells that produce insulin. It is instead the resistance that comes um, from, uh, uh, well, I mean, I guess we'll talk about the microbiome, but the bottom line is it's the development of insulin resistance, which basically requires your body and your pancreas to pump out more and more and more and more insulin. And eventually you get to a point where your body is literally incapable of producing an adequate amount of insulin to control your blood sugar. And at that point, your blood sugar starts to climb and that is type two diabetes. So when we're talking about these two conditions, which are very different, um, I guess I would start off with type two diabetes and say this, here's what we know. We know based upon this recent article that I was just citing that we believe that, um, that the microbiome changes are actually associated with the pathogenesis of type two diabetes. And what we're seeing is that the loss of short chain fatty acids, specifically butyrate, which is protective, which occurs when you have a diminished amount of these bacteria that I just mentioned, eubacteria, roseburia. When you lose eubacteria and roseburia and you don't have the production of butyrate, then you put yourself at risk for potentially the development of type two diabetes. Now, the entire pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes is not isolated to literally just this. We know that it has to do with intramyocellular fat, all right? But one of the key components, one of the key cogs is butyrate because butyrate, this short chain fatty acid that I'm telling you is produced by the metabolism of fiber, helps to heal our gut. It actually goes straight to the colonocytes, is absorbed there. And it helps them to not only be healthy, but to repair themselves and to repair any increased intestinal permeability. You see an increase for nerds like Cyrus, you see an increase in proteins like occludin. And occludin helps basically to seal the tight junctions between two cells in the lining of the intestine, in the lining of the colon. By sealing it, you are reducing intestinal permeability. When you reduce intestinal permeability, you reduce the release of bacterial endotoxin, also called called the lipopolysaccharide. So what's interesting about this lipopolysaccharide? Well, not done in humans, but in an animal model. If you take a mouse and you literally infuse bacterial endotoxin into that mouse, you do nothing else. You just infuse bacterial endotoxin. What happens to that mouse? The mouse becomes obese and develops type two diabetes. We know in humans that there are these changes that we've been talking about in the microbiome. And so the bottom line is that the different layers of evidence, whether it be in an animal model or in a human, we see that fiber is protective against type two diabetes. And we have human studies basically that show us these changes that occur in the gut microbiome that protect us from dysbiosis and the increased release of bacterial endotoxin. And now here I am saying that this bacterial endotoxin, if you were to infuse it into an animal and we would expect similar results in a human, the the infusion of bacterial endotoxin promotes obesity and type two diabetes, insulin resistance. So that's part of the pathogenesis of type two diabetes right there and how it connects back to the gut. 
And then type one diabetes is very interesting because what they have discovered is that it, in the laboratory world, you can um, use mice that essentially are completely free of microbes, germ free. All right, so they don't have a microbiome. And if you use a germ free mouse, which is predisposed genetically to developing type one diabetes, that mouse actually will develop type one diabetes. Now, when they study this further, what they've showed is that if you transplant into that mouse, the gut microbiome of someone who has bacterioides, which is again, a protective bacteria, an anti-inflammatory bacteria. If you transfuse, if you transplant that microbiome into that mouse that is predisposed to developing type one diabetes, with the proper microbiome, that mouse will not develop type one diabetes. So there have been a series of animal model-based studies that have basically demonstrated to us that alteration or damage to the gut microbiome, increased intestinal permeability, is associated with ultimately the development of type one diabetes, as well as type two diabetes, just a different pathogenesis. Okay, now, now there's many people who actually believe that uh, animal-based studies uh, are problematic because they say, well, the, the research that's been done in animal studies is can't necessarily be fully translated to human studies. And so the conclusions that you come up to from paying attention and participating in animal research uh, is sort of strictly confined to animals and may or may not translate to human beings very well. So in the setting of the microbiome, is there a strong reason to believe that the, the pathogenesis you just described is translational to humans? Well, we do know in both cases, both type one diabetes and type two diabetes, that there are alterations to the gut microbiome. Okay, so we know that to start with. Now the problem is that if you study a population of people who have type one diabetes, they already have the condition, right? They already have the condition. So it's really hard to do human-based studies to demonstrate a, uh, the ability to alter the risk of developing type 1 diabetes. We also know when it comes to type 1 diabetes that there are ways going back to early life, to your toddlers, to your newborns, that can reduce the likelihood of developing type 1 diabetes. So birth, uh, like vaginal delivery birth as opposed to cesarean reduces the risk of developing type 1 diabetes. Breastfeeding as opposed to bottle feeding reduces the risk of type one diabetes. A lack of exposure to antibiotics early in life reduces the likelihood of developing type one diabetes. Across the board, these things, which we know help to promote and foster an early healthy gut microbiome are protective against the development of type two, di I'm sorry, type one diabetes. And that if you alter that natural development of a of a newborn's gut microbiome during this critical time where they're also developing their immune system, then you increase the likelihood that that person later in life will develop type one diabetes. So I, I feel that there are layers of evidence with type one diabetes. And then when it comes to type two diabetes, I would argue that the evidence is even stronger. Of course, yes, we have epidemiologic studies that, sh that show us that, type, that fiber is good for the improvement and reversal of insulin resistance. We have, we have studies that show us that consistently. But what I, when, when we talk about this, I want to come back to the microbiome and say, well, what does the microbiome do? Because that's the argument that we're trying to make here. And they did a study where they took a group of young men who had metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance they treated them with antibiotics and then they transplanted into these young human men the microbiome of a lean donor, someone who, was not, who did not have metabolic syndrome, did not have insulin resistance. And they transplanted this microbiome into these young men and they see improvement in their insulin resistance markers. Now that improvement was temporary. It didn't stick. And the reason why it didn't stick is, be, is it goes back to what Robbie was talking about with your diet being the number one determinant of your microbiome. 
if you take these guys who have metabolic syndrome and type two, type two diabetes, insulin resistance, and you don't change their diet, and then you transplant the microbiome of someone who is lean and potentially has a totally different diet into them, those bacteria will survive for a period of time. And then over the course of weeks, they will die off. And they will be replaced by the old microbiome that this person had before because they haven't changed their diet. But if hypothetically you transplanted this lean donor microbiome into this person with obesity, metabolic syndrome, and insulin resistance, if you, if you give them that lean donor microbiome and you change their diet specifically to a plant-based diet, I would fully expect sustained improvement and reversal of the insulin resistance of type 2 diabetes. Could you hypothetically give those individuals or help them adopt a healthier diet and then they would create their own healthy microbiome without having to transplant? A hundred percent. That's exactly what, when you do the fecal transplant, you are creating a radical change that can be tracked instantaneously. And so it's really nice for research studies. It's proof of mechanism, right? It's proof of concept that by transferring literally just the microbiome to a new person, that you can alter their insulin resistance. That proves to you that the microbiome is relevant to the pathogenesis of insulin resistance, because that's the only thing that you changed. But in terms of changing your microbiome, 100%, it is not a requirement to have a fecal transplant. You can change your microbiome with your diet, and you just need to make that dietary change. Okay, there you heard it, guys. Good news. You don't have to get a fecal transplant in order to improve your insulin sensitivity.